Stats Insiders, welcome to this episode of our show. Today with me, I'm joined by David Sorbara. He's a non-tech SaaS founder, just like most of us. He's got four years of experience building his SaaS, Barclay HQ, and he's been also consulting other SaaS founders on how to build their business. And today, he will give us the guidance, he'll give us his know-how on how to onboard SaaS clients and keep them on board. With that said, David, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Vlad. Thanks for having me. David, in in a couple sentences, if you could give SaaS Insiders a bit more of your background and what people know you for. Sure, absolutely. So I have been working in SaaS for the last 15 years. Um, Before I started uh, Barclay HQ, I was over at another SaaS business um, working as an executive account manager. Um, And my role there, well, I wore many hats there, but my main objective there was customer retention and also marketing as well. As I started working there, I've always wanted to build my own SaaS business. So when I saw the opportunity to start Barclay HQ, which is a software specifically for pet groomers, um, I kind of just jumped all in. And then, you know, about six months of running Barclay HQ alongside my full-time job, I was easily able to you know, make enough money to support myself with just Barclay HQ to fully go all, all in on my own SaaS business. Nice. So, so, so you took it a bit like uh, gradually, right? Over time, getting getting traction with your SaaS so that you could leave sustainably. Sure. Yeah. Because it took a while to find the developers, um, come up with the, the product, build out the concept, design it, test it, and then start doing things like putting the marketing website up, building a community around it. So it, that was probably a couple of months in itself. But once it launched pretty quickly, my audience took um, gravitated towards it. So it grew pretty quickly where I was able to pay myself and not have to work full time and I can just fully focus on Barclay HQ. Now, one thing you've mentioned that's fun about developers, right? So sometimes it takes a bit a bit long to find your people. Sure, of course it does. One thing I'll, like, I'm currently writing my book that's called Founders Speak English, Developers Speak JavaScript. And it's a, it's a concept that describes that technical people, they, they think more in implementation while founders think more like in solutions to the problems. And sometimes there's a disconnect where, where, they, t- they, where they tend to not to overlap in the ways they talk. So it's a, it's a topic I'm observing all the time. Today, I wanted to talk to you and a lot of SaaS, SaaS insiders are listening about onboarding and keeping clients on board. Right. There are a lot of tactics and strategies that you can that you can learn out there when it comes to onboarding people, onboarding your clients, and also keeping them, like increasing their attention. Some of them are practical and some of them are not really. What principles do you find working for you and your SaaS when it comes to getting clients and keeping them in your business? Sure. So for re- customer retention, I'll start by saying this. Customer retention for SaaS actually begins before the customer even signs up. And what I mean by that is your marketing and what you're selling has to match what your SaaS product delivers. If it does not, if you overdid it on the marketing or you underdid it on the product, then say goodbye to that customer. So my first principle for sure would be make sure your sales and marketing align with your product, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Marketing and product are aligned. That's a principle number one. Of course, yes. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I would say what also has worked for me is focusing on the onboarding process. With Barclay HQ specifically, we onboard all of our clients with a training session. Um, We're able to do this because Barclay HQ is more of a high ticket SaaS. Um, They're paying a little bit more to use our product because it has a lot of value. So this is something that I've added a few years ago, not even from the beginning, and it drastically changed um, our retention rate here. So when I first started, I was kind of doing what everyone does, and that's I was sending new customers a welcome email, a user manual, um, here's our knowledge base, go figure out the product for yourself. But I found that you were leaving a lot of people who weren't even getting started with the SaaS product. And if they don't get started, then there's no way to retain them. So I definitely recommend for all SaaS businesses to have a strong onboarding process. If it's a higher ticket SaaS, like Barclay HQ, then onboard the manually one-on-one training sessions, really help them get set up, started so they understand the product. Um, If it's a lower ticket SaaS um, product that you're delivering, 
Well, then make sure your automated onboarding process is on point. You can use different tools to do this. You can use YouTube to your advantage, all sorts of things to help the customer understand how to get started and how to start using the product right away. Mm -hmm. So this like live onboarding sessions, they're more relevant to B2B SaaS probably, right? While for the B2C, because we take them like the volumes game, you want to like automate it as much as possible. Yeah, that's a great way to breaking it up. I would say for B2B, generally the business are going to be paying more to use your SaaS. So definitely have live onboarding for them. And then of course, B2C or even smaller B2B, like micro SaaSs that you're starting up, you can automate it. So you're not spending too much time and resources on each one client when they're only going to be spending 20, 50, $60 per month, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do believe that it probably has to do with the customer lifetime value, right? Because basically if your LTV is, let's say a thousand dollars for the whole life, lifetime value maybe it's not it's not as much you know relevant to onboard every single one of them with the personal with the personalized uh, session what do you think is the ltv that that would say like yeah we, we need to onboard them we need more like a uh, white glove experience sure i think that's that's going to be a different answer for for everybody but for me i think if the ltv of let's say the annual recurring revenue from the customer um, is exceeding a thousand dollars a year um, and, and they're going to hold on to five or six years. That's kind of the range where I would say, okay, you need to have live onboarding in place for that. So the principle number two is make sure we dial in the, the, the onboarding the right way, whether it's for a sure. yeah. session and or some kind of automation. That's correct. That's correct. The next thing yeah. I would say, and, and this is a big one that seems to be getting missed, um, is you have to keep your customers engaged on the platform. It's not enough just to give them a product that, you know, does save them time, save them money, helps them perform their job more efficiently. They have to stay engaged and excited about the platform. Um, and you can do this by, you know, letting them easily see results that you're getting from their SaaS. So, for example, for our groomers, now what we have is they'll get, you know, congratulations, you just booked 50 appointments for this week. Things like that to keep it really fun and interactive for them. Also easy for them to see the type of, you know, results that we're driving for their business. You know, just looking at boring reports, no one wants to do that anymore. So try to make it as engaging as you can. And engagement goes both ways as well. So not only are you doing things like that to let them see how they're being productive, being productive, how it's improving their day to day, um, but you also want to be engaging with them in, in terms of hearing what they're saying. So things like feature requests will come in. If you do build out those features, make it a big deal, you know, do some big things on social media, put out videos, even thank the customers for bringing it to them. That way they feel like they're part of the SaaS and they're part of the direction of the future roadmap of the company, not just letting them think, okay, this is the product and this is where it's staying. You always want to keep them visualizing that it's going to keep doing more because as their company evolves, so should your SaaS. David, I, I really like this point. There, there are a few things here, right? The, the overall the overall theme is engagement, basically meaning keeping them invested emotionally and morally into, into using this product with you. But there, there were a couple things. One of them is to almost like constantly reminding them on the value of the product. It's almost like repitching. You constantly tell them, hey, this is how much, let's say, time you saved, or this is how much you achieved this week, this much this, so they can see like, wow. This SaaS is really useful. Another another point I, I noticed you've mentioned is more of a, like a two-way engagement, basically getting their input on product, implementing it, and engaging with them actively. So it might be not necessarily related to the results they're they're getting, but more like how they contribute to a product to make them like prou proud of being a part of the journey. Exactly. That's exactly right. I'm taking notes. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Another way I would say, and this is kind of going off of everything we were saying before, is you have to deliver exceptional customer service. Um, again, this sounds pretty simple. A lot of people claim they do have exceptional customer customer service, but I'm surprised on how many startups and SaaS products I see that totally ignore their customer support. Um, and what I mean by that is they're leaving messages unanswered. Um, they're not training people who want to use their, their platform in B2B all sorts of things. 
I do recommend, you know, having live support, whether it's phone, chat, always being there where the customer needs you. Um, if you want them to stick with you, you're going to have to be there for them. And also when you are there for them, you're going to have to be transparent, solve issues as quickly as possible. I don't like when I see SaaS companies blaming outside factors. Um, it's your own business. So if there's an issue, be transparent, let them know what happened, why it happened. And most importantly, let them know what you're going to do to prevent it from happening again. Um, so this builds trust with the clientele that's going to last a lifetime. And it's also going to help them not feel so stressed out when the next issue arises. They know the team can handle it. They're going to respond to it quickly. They'll fix it so it doesn't happen again. Because in SaaS, things happen. There's no perfect SaaS product. Bugs, glitches, downtime. These are all things that your users are going to find. How you respond to that is going to control how they respond to it. If you're ignoring their tickets, not there to answer them when they're looking for the help, that's when they're going to get stressed out, ask to cancel the accounts, look to move elsewhere. But if you handle those situations properly, you can actually use that to work in your advantage. One thing, one thing I resonate a lot with is taking care of the customers, meaning in timely fashion, investing time, making them feel appreciated because... I was partnered with another SaaS company and it's it's more B2B probably because we're selling to business. And uh, the idea was once our software wasn't working, me as a CTO, we didn't have enough support team. So I was personally sometimes getting on calls with customers, actually seeing like what's not working, you know, and basically giving them recommendations on like, this is, this is why this is happening. The team was already working on this. This is the ATAs. I noticed that some of the people we took care of initially, they stayed for years. Like we're speaking like three years, people are staying. Even when like nothing is working, everyone's panicking. They're just like, no, I know Vlad will figure this out. It's like, and it's not like magic. It's it's just making sure that people know you're, you're there for them. Um, That's exactly right. I was wondering like, how do you handle live communication? Because you said like maybe a phone number or something to handle. Like in B2B, you probably have 100 up to 1,000 clients, and like it's, it's it's pretty significant already for a SaaS business. But if you're B2C, once again, if you're playing volume, right? Let's say you have 20, 30, 40,000 people, and like how do you manage those phone calls? I was, I was thinking about this, and I thought of Stripe. I think a lot of SaaS insiders know what Stripe is. You probably know as well, right? Yeah, I actually use Stripe. So have you ever went to their customer support? Yes, and I'm always fascinated by their customer support because you can request how you want them to contact you. And it's very quick. If you request a phone call, they're calling you within three to five minutes. At most 10 minutes, you'll have to wait for them to get on the phone. Um, and they have live chat and emailing as well. For our company, Barclay HQ, we, do, we have the same options available as well. We are B2B. So I do find when you're dealing with businesses, an issue is urgent. So I do like leaving the phone open for that. We have live chat on our website and built into the app as well. And of course, they can communicate with us through emails that turned into a ticket, that sort of thing. So we have all those different channels set up and Stripe does that really well as well. Now, the reason why I, I really find it brilliant, and I'm happy to do this as well, is instead of you calling them, you know, and just waiting for 10 minutes on the line, listening to some music that you start hating on the second minute, because it's repetitive and like you're just waiting. Why don't you request a call and they call you once they're ready, right? They just have a queue and they just make sure they clear it as soon as possible. And, and I really love this approach because you just get a call from them like in, in 10 minutes, as you said, right? But it's it, it doesn't feel like it's been 10 minutes on the phone when you're waiting for their music, you know? So I, yeah, exactly. I, and it, I, it gives that you're controlling the customer's expectations. It tells them we'll be there approximately in five minutes. So the customer knows, okay, in five minutes, I'm going to be speaking to someone about my issue. Um, so if you can control their expectations with little messaging like that, it's very helpful. Even auto responders to emails, you know, saying things like, I always like when I get these ones and we do it too. Hey, we received your uh, customer support request. This is an automated message that was sent out to let you know our team is on it and a live person will be with you shortly. So just doing things like that instead of leaving the customer on hold, whether they're listening to music or looking at their inbox, um, it's kind of always good just to control their expectations, let them know you'll be with them. And again, that's going to help build trust with them and keep them a little bit more calm when there is an issue. 
Now, I, I assume there is like a gazillion ways and approaches and systems to make your customer experience even better. But how would you define like an excellent customer experience? How do you know you got one? Let's say I'm a SaaS founder. I'm, I'm taking care of my clients, but I don't know. Like I'm listening to this episode and I'm thinking, do I have a great customer experience? Like, how do I know that? Like maybe some kind of feedback from customers. What's yeah, well, it, it absolutely has to come from their feedback. I think there's too many self-appointed. We have the best customer service platforms out there. This feedback actually has to come back from your customers. Um, if they're not rating you online, that's totally fine. A lot of new businesses, it takes a while to get on those websites, but you can send surveys out after every call asking them, how did we do today? You, Anytime you do something big for them, you can ask them, how did we do today? And have a couple of questions there that they can fill out and send this information back to your team. What's nice about doing that way too, especially when you're first starting, is it's all internal. So you can fix your internal processes before they make these reviews public. So if they're saying, hey, everything was good, but it took too long for you to get in touch with me, well, maybe now you need to think of, okay, how can I get them to them quicker? Um, maybe if I sent, put on an autoresponder, it could have helped them alleviate that, these sorts of things. One thing I'm thinking is, what if, for example, I want to monitor, let's say, my customer service quality from time to time? Do you think it 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 makes sense to maybe give some incentive to customers? For example, like, hey, we would be willing to give you X amount of credits on our system if you could, you know, give us the feedback and like spend three minutes of your time. Have you tried something like this? I mean, you could do that. I haven't tried anything like that. Um, I have a, the closest thing that I would have to that is a referral program where we, you, you know, we take a month, like that sort of thing where we uh, will help them out on their monthly payment if they refer someone else, someone else to us. Um, but no, I've never, you know, asked them, hey, do this, like kind of like say, hey, we'll reward you for giving this review. I think if you're engaging with your customers enough, you just asking them is enough because they'll feel like, oh, they want to hear what I have to say. But I guess if you were growing and you had, you know, tens, 20,000 users on the platform, that wouldn't be a bad strategy to quickly get them in. Got it. So the, the principle number four is make sure the customer support is excellent in the SaaS business. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we kind of covered a lot there. Cool. Yeah. The last principle I would say is build a community around your customers. So you can have a, a private Facebook group or Slack channel, allowing your customers to discuss amongst themselves about the product. Uh, what I like about this strategy is they'll go there for customer support. Like, how are you guys doing this to try to match problems that they may be having and asking other business owners. But what this also is going to do is it's going to allow freelancers to get involved and start selling services, helping with your SaaS product. So for example, if you have an email marketing platform, freelancers can jump in in this, in this conversation and start selling services to create the email, the copy, the design, the images for your users. Um, so they will help sell the product. Or you can also find an opportunity to bring these services in-house. So building a community will really allow you to find different revenue streams, allow other people to find revenue streams in your SaaS, which in turn will help you grow your SaaS product. Well, this like freelance concept, it almost sounds like I like can... And as a, like a micro economy on, on its own, like in a community, right? Where people start coming, helping implement your business. So it's like an ecosystem. Sure. On its own. Who I think did this very well was Wix.com. Um, mm -hmm. So everyone knows they let you go and build your own website. But if you ever try to use Wix.com, it's very time consuming. It's easy to use, but very time consuming. So what you found is a lot of people who have a business, um, and they wanted to get a website up. They tried building it on their own, but they they just couldn't get it work. Maybe they weren't tech savvy enough. So what people did to solve that problem is they started digital agencies that primarily focus on building Wix websites and using Wix's tools. So they're certified Wix partners, and they're now helping keep on board, like keeping the Wix customers on board. They're getting revenue from it. They're building their own business around it. And then also they would be selling Wix to any new customers that they speak to. So it kind of works both ways, which has always fascinated me. And I always try to think of ways how I can incorporate that in SaaS. Yeah, I like this example. I've, I've actually been invited to be a partner myself. Uh, we, we didn't go that route, but it's, it's basically like they are training like an army 
of agencies that, that support Wix customers so that they have revenue and people are using Wix. So it's kind of, it just locks everyone in. It's just exactly yeah. being around Wix. That's, that's, that's really brilliant. One feedback I had when it comes to communities is, so like I have this Facebook group of two to 3,000 people. And a lot of times when something's not working in the SaaS, people start complaining. And uh, sometimes if you don't moderate this, for example, if, you, if someone starts posting about their problems, like suddenly everyone else has this problem. Like, like no one had it, but then someone said like, hey, I think this is, not, this is not right. And suddenly everyone else is like, yeah, yeah, it's not right. But they didn't have this. Did you have experienced something like this? Or how, how, do, you, how do you moderate this? Do you just disallow negativity or just make it like freedom of speech completely? No, I, I I don't leave it like as freedom of speech is completely. I try to block out spam or too much negativity. So I do monitor the group, but I don't have all day to sit there and spend and, you know, manage a group. Our group has grown to 9,000 members in it and not even own within our own private group. If there's something wrong with your SaaS, they'll go to other groups where you're not really in charge and start, you know, hey, this is broken. Anyone else experiencing this issues? And it can start this big negative push around your product. But the way I've been handling that is I kind of ignored what's happening on social and focus what's happening in the business. So I stay in front of the problem directly with the customers. Like I said, all the points we just spoke about, if you're in front of the problem, if you're engaging with them uh, right away, if you're letting them know, hey, we're on it, don't worry, we're going to have it fixed, it kind of will help silence them on social media. So you kind of, in a way, drive their reaction to the problem. Someone, if someone reports a problem to you um, and you let them know, thank you, we're on it, we'll have it fixed very soon, chances are they're not going to go to social media. But if they report the problem and you ignore those messages and all of that stuff, going back to what I was saying earlier, that's when they're going to go to social media and start tearing you apart. So you have to kind of be in front of the problem. Focus on the business. Whatever happens on social media, you can't control. Um, you can learn from it, certainly, um, going through some stuff that could be real or fake, whatever. But focus on the business and you'll always be in a good spot. And they will even say, oh, well, it's fixed. Oh, my God, they fixed that so quickly. So you can turn a bad situation into a good situation. Yep. Yep. One thing I really love about this strategy of building an audience, like um, like a community, in a way that it creates, first of all, the sense of unity. People feel like we've got so many people like having the same product using it we might not be like the only suckers who use it it's probably like people are actually using it you know so like we're in a good spot we're in a growing community people feel uh more connected when they see a lot of other people that like basically using the same product you know it feels like they're not alone there so when it comes we saw a lot of collaborations actually happening in our SaaS, and that's and that's fascinating. Like people like joining forces to to build together using the software. I mean, it's it's just it's just fascinating. Yeah, for sure. I think there's a lot of value in creating the community. Even even before you launch, you can get started on creating a community. Um, let's say you wanted to build a, a, a SaaS business for travel agents. Start a Facebook group saying travel Ag travel agents unite. Let them join. While you're building your product, all you have to do is just find articles that are very relevant and helpful in their industry, share it in the group. So you're kind of posting once in a while, becoming a known person in the industry. And then when you're ready to launch, you already have this audience that you can launch to. So you don't actually have to go around finding who your leads will be, who your audience is. They're all kind of sitting right there and you can get their initial feedback and keep growing from there. And this is smart. This is really smart. SaaS Insiders, I want to make sure you pick this up as well. It makes sense to even start the community before you build your SaaS. Because first of all, you're preparing the list of people that will be interested in that. Secondly, you get real-time market feedback. You can basically just ask them, what do you think of this? What are your problems? And they will tell you what exactly do they need. So not only it's just kind of preparing in advance, but it also helps you make your idea more valid, more accurate. And uh, this, this is really, this is really gold. Uh, David, one thing is, now that we're discussing those principles and those strategies, what do you think is, is the biggest misconception you see about client retention that first time SaaS founders have, like people who are just starting out? Maybe you've spoke with a couple of them. What do you think are the things they get wrong? 
when trying sure. to sure like I see it, I hear it when I speak to other SaaS founders. I see their frustrations online um, when you're following a SaaS founder on Twitter, for example. The biggest misconception I see about client retention is that you can can retain your customers by discounting your product. If you're a first-time SaaS founder, please don't do this. Offering them a discount when they're asking to leave um, just cheapens your brand. And to be honest, we all find those win back messages saying, come back, save 20%, very annoying. Why not just offer that price in the first place? Um, because what you got to think of things like what happens when word gets out that you can save 20% by pretending to cancel. It's a mess and something I don't recommend. A company that does this, and I don't even know how well they're doing this anymore, but if you remember Sirius XM Radio, mm-hmm. they would call you, try to renew the subscription. If you just pretended you didn't want to renew, you would get it for half the price that you would have paid. Um, oh. And so goes down the line. Now, when you're working in numbers like they are, it makes sense, kind of. But when you're a very niche SaaS business and you start doing this, I, I don't think that's very good advice. If you're finding yourself to have to offer a discount to keep a customer on board, then you either have to reevaluate your pricing model or you have to reevaluate how you're selling your product because your customers are clearly not seeing the value that your product will bring them. Mm. I know a story like this. I was uh, I was a good friend with person who was selling uh, internet packages uh, back in the day. And what he has got is a script. And basically, if the client is answering the questions in a particular way that signals that he's not interested, the, the guy could officially offer like a huge discount to lock them in for like a year for almost like half the price. So what happened is he actually posted ads about like, hey, I can help you get this, this product half the price if you pay me like a small percentage of it. You know, There you go. What, what basically happened is the company did a disservice to itself. Like he onboarded a lot of people. He's got a lot of bonuses from company, but company really didn't didn't do well because of that. It, it's not the right thing because it just creates it just creates holes in your system and people like this will just use it. So why not being transparent and just give people the best price you could like in the first place, right? Exactly. Yeah. You have to really think of your pricing model. You know, as you're growing, your pricing model will increase because you're bringing more value. So you always have to consider th- these things. And going back to your 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 question was what is the biggest misconception? Well, the biggest misconception, and I even see some of these SaaS coaches saying this, oh, if they want to cancel slash 20% off, even if you did slash that 20% off and you managed to save them that phone call, chances are they're still not interested in using the product. So now you're just using the same time and resources trying to get them on board. They're using up data on the platform um, and they're kind of just sitting, sitting there idle because usually customers that start with, I need a discount or you have to give me a discount. They're not great customers. And that that's true for any industry. That, that's a really valid point, David. L- looking at your business, looking at Barclay H- HQ, what do you think are the elements in your business that play the biggest role in keeping your customers on board? Is it your stellar support? Is it the user experience, like the ever-increasing value? If you were to highlight maybe one, two, or three, whichever you, you would see fit, what do you think would be the the items that that really keep people in your system? Yeah, well, you kind of answered the question on your own. All three of those are super important to uh, keeping our customers on board. You have to have great customer support and that starts with the onboarding process. You know, even just with a lead that's come in, be responsive, let them know you heard them. Hey, do you want to see a demo of the product? How can we help you? Um, Those are good good things to do. That's going to show that the company has great communication. You mentioned uh, UX, but I'll say UI is very important. It has to be simple and modern. The UI is what will bring your customers on board. It's what they're going to see online, what they're going to see in the demo, but it's the UX that will keep them there. So make sure they are getting a good experience on the platform and are getting the results from it. Okay, got it, got it. Let, Let me ask you this question. If SaaS insiders and people, other people who are watching this, listening to this episode, if they were to take take away just one thing out of this conversation, just like one piece of advice that was the most important piece, what what that would be on improving the user retention in their SaaS businesses? 
the one important piece, I would say you have to have strong customer support for sure. I would say strong customer support, but you can break that down into so many, you know, subcategories and everything that we're speaking about, I think all kind of combines to be the perfect way to keep your customers on board. Like, so as I was saying that, I was saying, well, customer support is the the most important, but at the same time, if you don't have a good product, no amount of good customer support is going to keep the customers on because the product is lacking. So everything kind of has to be in this equation equally. And that's how you would get the highest customer retention rate. I, I guess the, the true the true meaning of, of retention is basically imagining yourself in your customer's shoes and asking like what I could do better for you in a way, right? Like what what they could do better for me, right? In terms of what the product is missing currently. Maybe there is a support issue. Maybe I'm not getting fixes. I'm not getting resolutions of some of the problems I have. It's just trying to, the way we did it at least is, we try to imagine as much as possible, what do they feel, you know, when they get an email from us or they don't get an email from us, for example, right? What happens, what we do on board them or we don't. So I think if we emotionally position ourselves in, in a customer's shoes, we would be able to see from their perspective like what's lacking in the business? I, I guess that's pretty hard to do. Yeah, pretty hard to answer. And that's exactly right. And it's pretty hard to always put yourself in the customer's shoes, especially when you're the founder of the business, because you kind of become emotionally attached to your product. You think it's going to be their problem solver. They're all going to need it. But the truth is, put your shoes in their foot. How would it be if you were running their business and using this product, uh, this sort of thing? Yeah, I'm just wondering, do you have any, any tactics, any strategies? Like, let's say... If you were to to get to your customer's shoes, like what's the best way to really to really get there? Is it is it like surveying them or um, some something else? No, in this case, I don't think surveying will work very well. You actually have to go there. Um, when I first started Barclay HQ, I didn't know anything about the pet grooming business. To me, it seemed like a pretty simple thing. You drop your dog off, they clean it up, they give it a haircut. And away they go, but there's so much going on behind that. And the way I learned it is I just, you know, I'm in the industry now, so I'm kind of keeping up to date on different tools they use, not only software, but, you know, the scissors they like to use, the clippers they like to use, um, the tables that they cut their dogs on. So you just have to be in the industry and completely educate yourself around all aspects of what they would be using in their business. And that's kind of how you can put yourself in their shoes. When I first started Barclay HQ, I was actually going to local groomers in my area, meeting with them, giving them a flyer on what I was working on, asking them, hey, would it be okay if I, you know, sat with you guys for 15 minutes to pitch you the software I'm building and maybe take some feedback on what you would like to see in the software? Because at the time, a lot of these groomers were still using pen and paper um, so mm -hmm. when I did that, I got a few customers on board, actually one of my best customers to this date. Um, they're still on board with us. They have multiple locations. I landed by doing that. I went into one of their locations. I didn't even know they had multiple locations, handed them a flyer. A couple of weeks later, the owner called me. I didn't have an office at the time. So we actually went to a Boston pizza, um, which is like a restaurant here. We met at the Boston pizza, had a meeting. I did a demo. Um, and I got them on the product pretty quickly. Uh, that company actually provided a lot of feedback in the early stages of what the software should have, what it shouldn't have. So that's how we kind of kept building it out. But yeah, you have to put yourself in, in their shoes. It wasn't until I started going into grooming salons, looking at it as if I worked there as an owner um, and, and looking at other things they use that really helped me understand how to better build the product that I was building for their business. No, no, that's that, that's a truly really bootstrap story here. You know, when you when you meet the clients at the pizza restaurant, that that's that, that's that's the true story. Like, um, I'm really I'm I'm really proud of of this journey. And I also want to point out, like Sas and Sardis, if you're listening really carefully, the way David did it is he initially went to those grooming businesses that weren't his clients, and he was just asking basically for feedback. He was positioning it as, "Hey guys, can I get like 15 minutes of your time?" I've got this product, I'm looking for feedback. So it's almost like he's asking for help, not for the clients, you know? And I feel like what that what that did is it kind of lowered down the barrier, like, you know, like their defensive mechanisms, like, oh, you're going to sell me something in a way, right? But the way you position this, at least how you described it is, like, can I get some feedback from you? That's right. You, you said that absolutely perfectly. If you go in there selling, they're going to close the door on you. 
Um, I was kind of taking the approach that I was asking them for their opinion. Hey, I'm going to custom build this for your website or for your business. Sorry. And uh, that way where people kind of feel the value because everyone likes to talk about their business. So they're going to tell you what they need. And then if you can help them in even the smallest way, then the conversation will keep going. Um, Another thing you can do that your audience should know is if you're younger, you can also pretend that it's a project you're working on for school. You'll be amazed how many people are open to saying, yeah, no problem. You can come in here and, and we'll give you the feedback that you need. So you can say things like, hey, uh, me and my friends were doing this project um, and, and we would like to uh, get your feedback on, on what we're working on here. You'll be amazed on how many business owners or even just industry leaders will be open to having a conversation with you and you can get in the door right that way. No, it's fun that you mentioned this because I was even hearing that these tactics learn for competition analysis. Like you can call them and say like, hey, I'm doing this, you know, research uh, from the university. Can I get like some questions on how your business is doing? And they're like, yes, well, let me tell you everything that works in my business and why it's successful, you know? So <laughs> it, it it truly works. It truly works. When, when you're it, it does, for sure. I wouldn't put yourself in a position where you're like, actually, if you're not in university and you're pretending in university, I would just say project. Uh, maybe you're taking night classes, mention the school that you're doing the night classes in. I, I, I wouldn't overdo it on the, the faking it, but definitely people will help you if, you if you mention that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, correct. What I'm trying to say is it's coming from the position of, hey, let me learn from you in a way, because people love when you when you kind of ask them questions, when you give them the opportunity to share, right? It's just It, it, it just really helps them to open because they genuinely want to give it the value itself. So it's it, it, it's really wonderful. Because we have this community, the SaaS insiders, and a lot of them are SaaS founders, some of them are SaaS VCs, and we have this collaborative community where people help each other. So I was, the question that I am and the community is wondering is, what do you think are some of the biggest, probably challenges that you're currently facing in order to continue to grow Barclay HQ, right? Maybe some kind of people, some kind of connections, some kind of resources. What are the things you currently need to to elevate your business so that people that, that are listening to this might reach out and help? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, there's always different obstacles that uh, that are going to be in place when you're trying to grow your SaaS business. For us, one of our biz- biggest obstacles is we're selling to non-tech savvy people. So it's trying to convert educate groomers why they should be using a software as opposed to um, pen and paper. So although we're in a very niche market and it's easy to find the people to talk to, at the same time, that poses a problem on finding new people to talk to and and share your story with. Um, So I would say that's kind of the biggest obstacle for us. But my my biggest piece of advice for new start, uh, new SaaS founders or new startups is do exactly that. Find a niche stay in it, become an expert in that niche, and then move to the next vertical and then the next vertical and the next vertical. Don't try to do too many at one time because then there's going to be too many obstacles in place. Well, like they say, riches are in the niches in a way that you got to start small so that you can address one problem much better than anyone else and grow from there. Grow from there because you have the audience now, you have the capacity, and, and you can scale. That's a really valuable piece of advice. I know you've been in SaaS business and general in business, not like for three days, right? You've been in four years at Just Barclay HQ and some other experience. You probably read some books. You probably heard some inspirational speakers that might have inspired or directed you at some point towards the right direction. If you were to name three resources, and so it can be books, people, mentors, people you follow, who have been the most instrumental to your success over the last couple of years? I don't, I don't know any any books off the top of my head that would help the SaaS insiders um, audience, but I can say, you know, some people or mentors that I've had in my life that contributed to my success. Um, uh, definitely my dad, he certainly played a big, important role in my entrepreneurial journey. He was actually a SaaS founder and owner as well. Um, and he successfully exited his business um, so he's full of great of uh, free advice and tips for me. So that's always good to have him in my corner. Uh, someone else that I always find uh, very interesting is the founder of Dollar Shave Club, Michael Dubin. Um, I'm hope I'm pronouncing that c- 
correctly. Um, but I always found what he did uh, very intriguing. He wasn't necessarily a SaaS founder, but he still built a subscription business and he did it all while having fun and joking around. He's wrote a few good books. Like I said, I can't remember the names off the top of my head. So just look him up. He's got a lot of stuff. And I really think I've gravitated towards him because he was really one of these first new age CEOs um, where they don't take things too seriously and they have a lot of fun in their business. And in that all was transparent in his marketing and his marketing led to his success. And he ended up selling for a billion dollars. So I really liked that story with that guy. Um, and another resource I would say for all, you know, no matter your position in SaaS, whether you're, you've been there for a while, um, whether you're a sales guy in SaaS, whether you're a developer in SaaS, whether you're marketing in SaaS, whether you're a founder in SaaS, one of the best resources you can use is Udemy. Um, I find it super helpful. I take courses there for many different things. I do use a marketing agency for Barclay HQ, but for me to have better conversations with that marketing agency, I took a Facebook marketing masterclass, which has really helped me improve and understand um, how I can leverage Facebook to grow my business. Things like that are very helpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as for Dollar Shave Club, right? It's regardless of whether he's selling like SaaS, like software, basically as a service, right? But he's selling other service. He's selling like razor blades in a way, right? And the way the way to make a, a commodity that people just, you know, buy for pennies to make it a subscription to build their attention. Now that, that takes some some experience to provide, some some service to make it worth to pay for it. And I think that that's exactly what we need to learn as SaaS founders. Because the moment we figure out how to make our offer so sticky that it just, you know, it just makes sense to keep, to keep in, to keep in it. That's that's I think that's what we can learn from those from those guys. I'm always curious when I'm talking to people is how do you define success for you? I mean, you've you've been building the SaaS business. It looks like it is growing at a steady pace. I know you are also doing some consulting with other SaaS founders. At this stage of your life, how do you how do you define success? Like it can be something personal, business related, financially, or just in general life. There is no right answer for. Sure. Yeah, you see this question get asked everywhere in a lot. You know, what does success mean to you? I think for entrepreneurs that there is no answer to that question. I don't think success for a true entrepreneur can be measured. I think it's always going to be a moving target that you will always chase. I don't know. Um, I'm still very early on as being my own entrepreneur. Um, but if I had to try to summarize what success means, I think it would be having the freedom to do whatever I want. It would be meaning my family's dreams are all made true and that I'm in a position um, to constantly give and never have to take. Um, so I think that's what success would would mean to me. Got it. Got it. So it's a freedom of uh, saying no to certain things that you don't want to do and basically making sure that your family and your close people are taken care of. Yeah. You, you know, I, I kind of, I don't know, because what you just said there, I think you should always say no to things you don't want to do, even, even as an early on entrepreneur with zero revenue. Um, you should always do what you want to do. Don't ever take the path where you feel like you need to do something because that's going to make you successful. I think, you know, your personal health and your mental health is definitely really important, even in the beginning of your of your career to pay attention to. So I, I think, you know, just for me, success would be, I guess you're, I get, I get what you're saying, the freedom to do whatever you want. But for me, it would be in a position to constantly give um, and never have to take. Okay. Okay. Well, that's brilliant in terms of like saying no in the beginning. Because I know a lot of times we have this, you know, beginner mentality or, oh, I'll take this client, I'll take this thing because I'm new to this, right? So, and we're kind of, kind of making mistakes along the way. And over time, we'll actually learn that it wasn't worth it in a way, right? We can start the right way. Like there is, there is, there is no one else's permission we should take to, you know, to, to be worthy of something more than, than just the beginner's mentality. So, That's right. Yeah. That's right. And no two paths are the same. Before we we'll be wrapping up this conversation, David, I wanted to give you some opportunity to share what what would be the best ways the founders, the SaaS insiders could connect with you to learn more about what you do to add value, maybe ask for help, and what would be the resources they could check out maybe on Barclay HQ or maybe on some other events on some other 
you know, projects that are coming up that you would like to share? Sure, for sure. And, and, I, and I appreciate that. I actually just started working on building my personal brand. So for that, you guys can follow me directly on Twitter and Instagram. That's where I am so far. The handle is at David M. Sorbara. Um, so David M. Sabara on Twitter and Instagram. I do post a lot more on Twitter um, about, you know, I, I'm kind of building Barkley HQ in public and I will be launching um, a new SaaS business very soon. And we'll be doing the launch on Instagram and um, Twitter there as well. So if you wanted to follow along to see what, what I have in the works that I've been working on for the last 15 to 17 weeks, um, we'll be launching that on, on those platforms. For Barkley HQ, if you're interested, you can check that out at barkleyhq.com. Of course, it's on all social media platforms as well. And anyone who's using Barkley HQ that may be listening to this, if you have any questions, um, feel free to give us a call or if you could potentially use Barkley HQ, um, just mention that you've heard us on this uh, on this podcast and we'll take care of you. Awesome. Awesome. David, we'll be putting all of those links that you've mentioned in a description for this episode so people can easily access them as well. Perfect. To, I would appreciate that. To to wrap up this conversation, what, what would you like to say like as as the as the conclusion of this topic? What 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 would you would you like to end it on? Sure. Yeah. Something that we didn't touch on and that I think we should end it on is talking about churn. Churn is very frustrating. Listen, churn sucks and it's gonna happen. Uh, when you're just starting, it's the worst feeling in the world. Believe me, I know so many of us know. Um, some customers are going to let you know why they're canceling. Some customers will not say anything. Um, it all sucks, but it's part of being a SaaS company. Don't feel alone in that. Use the information you have and try to fix the problem. For example, if they're not getting set up at the start, then help them by onboarding them. Um, if they don't like or do like the user user interface or user experience, you can work on that as well with new colors, layouts, new features, this sort of thing. Uh, what's nice, guys, when this is happening, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Look at other su successful SaaS companies, listen to other founders and take creative ideas from all of that. And if I was going to say, if how do you retain these customers and avoid the churn, just be a company that customers want to be with. Be helpful, responsive, produces results. Do these things and it'll help your uh, user retention and help your company grow. David Sarbara, everyone. Don't be afraid of churn. Embrace the challenge and learn how to be the company that your people want to be in. David, I thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Vlad. I really appreciate this. SaaS Insiders, we'll see you in the other episode.